Programs. So let me now introduce our moderator, Eric Savitz. After spending a couple of decades at Barron's, about a year and a half ago, Eric joined Forbes as the San Francisco Bureau Chief to help with their reinvention. He writes a terrific blog called The Tech Trade, and he's a frequent TV and radio commentator. Uh, one of the things that makes him uniquely qualified to lead the discussion tonight is that back in the internet bubble days, Eric himself did a three-year stint as an entrepreneur. He was executive editor of the Industry Standard, so he experienced that phenomenal cycle of boom and bust, and he felt that from the inside as well as covering it from the outside. And luckily, he lived to tell the tale, so let's give our warmest welcome to Eric Savitz. Thank you. Be careful what you say up here, because Jeff is tweeting from the stage. McClure isn't here, so someone has to do it. <laughs> I was going to blog from the stage, but I couldn't figure out where to put my laptop. Um, so thanks very much. So I'm going to ask our panelists to, um, to give us a few words each on, um, on who they are, what they do, and what their bias is a little bit on this uh, topic of uh, running, uh, uh, getting a running start for startups. Let's start um, at the end with Heidi. Oh, mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Heidi Roizen. I currently have two jobs. One is I'm a venture partner at DFJ. So I try to talk people into taking venture capital. And the other one is I teach entrepreneurship at Stanford, where I try to talk people into out of, out, I try to talk people out of taking venture capital. <laughs> so uh, wow. that's my bias. Go figure it out. <laughs> That's two biases in one. Well, That's there great. we go. It depends on the audience. <laughs> uh, so I'm Don McCaskill, the uh, co-founder, CEO, and chief geek at Smug Mug. Uh, we are a bootstrap startup, um, and uh, and we are fast approaching our 10-year anniversary. So it's been uh, it's been quite the roller coaster, and it's been tons of fun. Um, I guess my bias, uh, having done a few startups that were venture-backed prior to Smug Mug, is that. I think uh, you can do it without, uh, and that it's often a great path to choose. Great. I'm uh, Dan Lewin, and I work at Microsoft. We're a big software startup. We write software for Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bias towards startups. Um, I come out on both sides of the coin on this, but in general, I think that it's a really good thing that startups can get a running start and that it doesn't take that much money. And I have points of view on why I think that's really important and why I think it'll make a, a bigger difference than people think uh, in the coming years. Great. Paul? I'm, uh, I'm Paul Kodrowski, most of the time with the Kauffman Foundation, the rest of the time just sort of screwing around on Twitter. And uh, I, uh, I guess my bias on all this stuff is, is I, I don't know who said this first, I think it was like Al Capone, it's that it takes a lot of dead bodies to fill a swamp, and I sort of feel that way about <laughs> startups, you know, that it's sort of, you just got to, it, it, more is always better than less, and it applies to an awful lot of things, not least of which startups, so. Uh, you should what, say that, this is a great OH. So Jeff Clavier, <laughs> um, entrepreneur, then traditional VC, and now sort of micro VC, whatever they call it these days. Um, my bias is that it's an awesome time to start a company and there are so many ways to actually get off the ground and prove yourself. And whether you raise a little bit of money or you don't raise that much money is actually just the way you get started. Um, I put SoftTech VC together uh, about eight years ago because I saw this funding gap between you know, the pure angels and the, uh, the VCs that were you know, investing $25,000 and $5 million, and there was a need for the half million dollar round. And that's what uh, I put together uh, this micro VC fund for, and a lot of my peers actually did the same. And we've now sort of become the go-to guys from entrepreneurs to get to raise their first round of money. Um, for the record, uh, Dunn is one of a few startups that has consistently said no to me when I said, can I please invest? <laughs> and, you know, I still like him. <laughs> I like you too, Jeff. Nice you. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I, I want to challenge, just to start off here, it's sort of the, there's an underlying premise of the, this panel. Uh, we're saying, you know, running start for startups. This all sounds great, right? It's a great thing. Is this a great thing? Uh, there's another way of looking at this, would say, which would be to say, the skeptic's view might be uh, the baron's view. I'm not sure if it's the Forbes <laughs> view anymore. It might be <laughs> Is that there's an inherent problem here, that this is the, the, the easy uh, route to startups is the bubble route to startups, that there's a bubble in the startup part of the technology um, environment. So is that, is that fair, uh, or uh, is, is it really a, 
Is it a good thing or not a good thing? Go ahead, Daniel. You're closest. <laughs> you deal with it. Not Daniel's going to go. I think we're going through it. Just at a, again, I'll because these guys are sort of acting. Paul's got a lot of the data and lots of points of view, and the rest of them are sort of acting in the, with on, as, an, as an entrepreneur or as financiers. I think that everybody in the room can appreciate the fact that there's a very large structural realignment going on in in the world in work and in jobs. And I do think that the the notion that we have in Silicon Valley, especially because if you think about startups and you don't think about Silicon Valley, that's you're missing the starting point, at least for this conversation. Um, I think on a global basis that the notion of cloud services and connected devices, smart devices, is, is fundamental to realigning the way work is going to be done on all fronts. Mm -hmm. And it's not all pure tech, new algorithms, or just servicing you know, what we think about as classic startups in Silicon Valley. I think it's really about a lot of new businesses being created, many of which will be small businesses, therefore startups that will have a huge impact on a global basis over the next few years. So I'll sort of set that as a premise from the big company, the way we look at the world, where lots of small businesses using our technology is a really good thing. And many of them will be new, new companies because they'll be restructuring the economic impact of how they sell olive oil, if you will, by using the web. Right? So, so though, it, 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 in a world in which there's a realignment, I just, I just have to ask this. Uh, it, it's killing me. Uh, um, if, you, if you're going to realign the world of work, isn't there a lot? Doesn't that imply, in a nice way of saying, tremendous collateral damage? Like yeah. That, that lots of people <laughs> yeah. are going to lose Huge jobs? failure. Yeah. Gonna, I think it'd be lots of failures and, and all that. Well, but, but beyond but, failures, I mean, I think there's ripples. Out but, well, the, I don't know. I've been reading the news for the last four or five years. It looks like that's what's going on. Right. So, yeah, a lot of collateral damage. I, I, I think that's true. Well, I, and I sort of think that's sort of healthy and a good thing. Um, so, uh, one of the things I. So it may be causing a bubble in terms of there seem to be a whole lot more startups out there, and they're getting more coverage and more awareness, and there more people are getting a swing at the bat, so to speak, which I think is fabulous. Um, but we're also finding that uh, they're failing faster too, um, with a much lower sort of amount of damage. The damage is sort of localized, right? Um, so. So it's sort of um, a couple of smart guys or gals come up with a great idea, and they get to throw it out there much quick, more quickly than they ever have before and see what happens. And if what happens turns out to be magic, then they get to grow it or join another team that's heading in that same direction or something in a way that I don't think we've seen before. And I, I think that's all awesome. So to me, you don't know where the next disruption is going to come from. And the thing is, if you look at um, the startups, which are the hot thing of the day, the week, the month, uh, there's always like, so everyone talks about Pinterest or talks about Instagram. And if you look at how quickly those, these two startups have become you know, so prevalent and everyone talks about them and you look at how small those teams are, but how huge their footprint is, it's kind of insane. And it's unprecedented. The the footprint you can get if you play the uh, mobile, viral, social world really, really well. On the bubble um, sort of question, I agree with Don, you measure a bubble by the um, negative effect of it blowing up. And if ever the, the Web 2.0 bubble sort of uh, bursted and everyone sort of lost the cash they've put in, it's a bunch of you know, rich guys who would have lost a bit of their net worth and who cares, right? And so it's not like uh, 2000 where the entire market sort of bombed it's really sort of highly concentrated. And if they want to play Russian roulette with their money, it's their choice. The big question is, if you look, if you look at it from the standpoint of VCs that try to um, ride that wave of innovation and, and thousands and thousands of startups you know, being created every year, it's figuring out which one or which ones are really showing the signs of hypergrowth. And this hypergrowth, which is obviously what we hope to find in, in the companies we invest, and we only only do 20 investments a year is really sort of that, that lever that gives, gives you the feeling that you're in a rocket ship and you know whether you're, you're going to go or whether you're going to blow. But it's pretty fascinating. I, I, I just, this is the part where I sort of do my, I'll channel the spirit of hands rustling and do like a graph with my fingers. Hmm. Um, so, you know, the thing that I find really interesting about all this stuff is that, um, well, I'll put it in the form of a question. So, so over the last 15 years, what's happened to the 
you sort of pre the, the amount of venture capital in the U.S. economy as a percentage of GDP. Anyone want to hazard a guess? So these venture capital dollars in total as a percentage of U.S. GDP. In the last 15 years. Yeah, 15 years. So so as we've gone through a full cycle, it's fallen off a bit. But what do you think, anyone want to hazard a guess? What's what's it done? Dollars as a percentage, yeah, that's right. So it's just it's sort of dollars <laughs> allocated as a percentage of GDP. Let's leave aside whether they're productive dollars or not. So, so, so dollars as a percentage of GDP has almost, has almost gone up by two and a half, not quite as high as total dollars under management in the, uh, in, in the venture industry, but as a percentage of GDP, which is a good way of kind of normalizing it, right? Because it's not enough to just know that the amount is growing. Well, you know, you may not have noticed, but the U.S. is bigger too. So, so, that, so, so let's sort of start there, right? So that's kind of interesting. At the same time, what's happened to the number of entrepreneurship programs in the United States over the, la over the similar period? Over the same period in the United States, the number of entrepreneurship programs in this country has grown by roughly a factor of six. So six times. Mm -hmm. Now let's leave aside what happens in accelerators and incubators and whatever iterators, everything else, right? There's, it's gone up by a factor of six. So those are all great things, right? And so they'd be driving a lot more entrepreneurial activity. So what's happened to the rate of company creation in the United States, okay, per capita, over that period. So we're going to normalize it against population, right? So this is my Rosling moment. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so what's happened to that over that period? The answer is, and it's, and it's one of the most bizarre things you'll see, and no one seems to want, ever want to talk about it, is it's actually declined as a percentage of GDP, or, as a, or as on a per capita basis, which means that one of the most bizarre graphs that you can ever come up with if you want to piss off your favorite business academic is show that the growth of entrepreneurship programs in the United States is perfectly inversely correlated with the number of startups per capita we produce in the United States, which suggests that the fastest way to get more startups is to kill all the entrepreneurship programs. But obviously that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> that can't possibly be true. But so, so the question you have to ask yourself is if you know, we're having this conversation as if this microcosm of, of bizarre behavior that is the valley is somehow representative of the entire That's United right. States, and the reality is this country on a per capita basis produces fewer, fewer startups per capita than any time it has in the last 25 years. And so the question we should be asking ourselves is why? Is that the right number? And if it's not, you know, what can we do about it? And, you know, and at Kaufman, you know, we sort of posit that it's one of the problems is this great sucking sound from other sectors of the economy that yanks some of the best and brightest off to create sort of you know, weapons of mass financial destruction to screw us all up. And, and that's mm -hmm. been a big part of the problem, that engineers and scientists wander off to do other things. You know, one of the biggest recruiters at the peak of the financial bubble in 2005 at MIT was Wall Street. It wasn't Google. It wasn't Microsoft. It wasn't anyone else. You were competing against Goldman Sachs. And so this, 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 this challenge, you know, why is it that the rate of startup creation in the United States on a per capita basis has declined? And so I see everything that's going on right now in terms of driving more startup creation is entirely laudable because it flies in, you know, it really sort of tries to turn a curve around, this curve that's, you know, deeply troubling and has nothing to do with what's happening in the Bay Area in terms of, you know, the, the, the Pinterest of curling or something that's coming out next. But what's so, interesting uh, is... Let, let Heidi jump in. I, I'm, I'm going to jump in here because I, I think this is, this is the critical thing about where we are. And you asked the original question is, the fact that one can get a startup off the ground for so little money, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And I think that's a really good thing, right? Less money is wasted getting to a minimally viable product that you can go out and try. The bad thing is if you all think that if you do that, you're going to be Facebook, right? And, and, and this is this Silicon Valley thing where, you know, the students in my class, they come in and they all want to raise money and they all want to, you know, go public and all of that. And, and, and you know, to me the question is, you're an entrepreneur, are you building a restaurant or are you building McDonald's, right? There are a lot of people who build great restaurants and they have great lives and they're passionate about it. And you know, I meet with entrepreneurs all the time who've built a great website and it's around their passion. It's around food or it's around this or it's around that. And they can make twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a month, you know, through their various business models, right? Twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a month when you're a one-person company, that's a huge lifestyle success. Twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a month when you've raised five million in venture, you are toast. You're dead. And so, you know, the question is sort of what do you want to be? And and this is why my, my joking comment about it, I try to talk most people out of venture capital because most businesses are not appropriate for venture capital. What most entrepreneurs don't think about is when a venture capitalist invests in you, they expect to get at least ten times their money back sometime through your either getting acquired or going public. That's kind of how it works. So if you don't want to get acquired or go public and you want to build a business you're passionate about and you want to sort of make more money than you spend, if you can do that without invested capital, you can run a hell of a business. There are people on, you know this, there are people on eBay who make millions of dollars a year. There are people on Just Answer who make millions of dollars a year. I mean, it does happen that people can run these businesses, but it's all about your expectations and what money you bring in and what, as soon as you bring that money in, you've done a deal. I don't want to say the devil because 
you know, <laughs> shoot. We don't want you all to like, go away. But, you know, as soon as you've done that deal where you bring in investors, you have set up exit expectations, which may not be appropriate for your business. And that's why I think it's great that we can all start businesses, but we better right size the business to the expectations and to the amount of competition that is out there in every one of our spaces. So there are also some other kind of inherent um, uh, contradictions in the idea that it's super easy to start a business. So one of the things is, well, so uh, beyond the obvious that it's like not super easy to start a business, right? Um, ask anyone who started a business, like people in the past. But beyond that, if you talk to people in the Valley about like, well, what's it like out there? How, how, what's the tone of the business? So one of the questions that comes up every time is, so how are you doing hiring engineers? And you ask them, you know, oh, no one has ever said to me, I can hire as many engineers as like, we can get in the door. It's really hard, right? So isn't, there's, there's some other elements to this that it's not so easy to start a business. And I, I, I wonder if, you, if anyone wants to sort of riff about that particular part of the problem. Well, it's easy to start. It's, it's as difficult as it was, you know, 10 years ago to scale. And today in the Valley, as you pointed out, there is such a... a um, uh, a contraction of the um, of the engineering or marketing or whatever hires market that you need to figure out where you're going to go and hire your people whether it's you know employ them in Canada or in Argentina or you know what in Canada get in with Argentina in, <laughs> or in France for that matter um, and um, there are engineers in France oh they are excellent okay. engineers in France absolutely no, seriously I'm, I'm not joking they're excellent the problem is that you have to deal with them <laughs> <laughs> and so um, <laughs> but, the, but the point is that trying to build and scale your startup in the Valley means that you actually have one of those uh, meteors that everyone wants to join. And so if Instagram wants to hire you know, their 12th or 13th engineer, like everyone, everyone in his mother is going to try and, and get that job. But if you are a, a OK startup doing well, but you're not like on, on the front page of TechCrunch every, every second day, you won't have that, that same ability. So figuring out how you scale your engineering and where you get your resources is actually one of the key issues of everyone at every stage of the scale, whether it's you know, you're going from 5 to 10 or 10 to 20 or 50 to 100. But has it gotten worse? Because there are all these people oh, yeah. trying to yes. go from oh, done. Yeah. I mean, you're Much you're the one doing the, the hiring. I'm yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's never been easy to hire uh, engineers. And particularly designers have also gotten incredibly difficult over the last decade or so as as sort of some of these technologies have matured, we've gotten better at making them more usable and better looking and things that require a lot of design talent. But other than right maybe 2000 to 2003, where it was considerably easier <laughs> to find engineers, it's gotten a lot harder than, than I've ever seen it in the Valley. Um, and, and so yeah, uh, that, that part of scaling the business is still ridiculously hard. Um, uh, you still have to convince, you know, maybe with no product, right? It might just be two of you and you finally have a product out there that nobody's heard of and you need person number three or maybe 10 or 50 or whatever. As, as Jeff said, it, it, at any point along the scale, hiring that talent is uh, incredibly difficult. But I don't think, um, I think that's true of very uh, well-backed uh, ventures as well as bootstrapped um, guys and, and uh teams in a dorm. I think it's across the board. If you were to ask Facebook or Twitter, clearly they're on the front page of TechCrunch all day, every day. They have deep pockets, and they still have a hard time hiring the talent they need. So, But don't you think, don't you think Donna, I mean, it's, it's supposed to be hard? I mean, yeah, in, sure. in a weird way, it's, you know, it's this kind of one of the fastest ways to lose money in venture capital is to run a regional arbitrage strategy where you say, well, I could do this in Silicon Valley, but it'd be much cheaper to do it in, yeah. you know, Sioux City. And so I'll do it there. Nothing against Sioux City, maybe something. And, and so, and so you, you do it somewhere else because it's cheaper and it's a, it's a magic way to lose money. There's a reason why things are expensive to do in the Valley. It's because there's a hotly competitive market where things are priced slightly above market like happens in all hotly competitive markets. And so it's expensive to do stuff here, but there's a reason why it's expensive to do stuff here. And, and by the way, when we talk about capital efficiency and the fact that it's very cheap and easy to start, it's true. But it doesn't mean that the scale isn't right. as expensive as it used to be. So if you look at you know, paid in capital, which is the amount of money that uh, an average startup that is doing well has raised, 
you know, 10 years ago, it might have been 50 million to get there. And today it might still be 50 million to get there. But if you look at the timing of those 50 million, it's completely different. Where the company will have raised, you know, today, an average of one to $2 million seed round. And they will have gone for 12, 18, 24 months on that cash. They will have proven a ton of assumptions that will allow the next guys, who are the series investors, to feel comfortable to plunk in, you know, anywhere from five to eight to ten million dollars, and they will sort of get the company for another couple of years. And if the company is is one of those sort of meteoric rises, almost immediately, or maybe a few weeks, or a few months, or a couple of years later, someone will come with a thirty million dollar check. And so it's not that the company is cheap to run or build; it's just that yeah, the risk fine. taken by the early stage guys will have really paid paid up for the entrepreneur in terms of dilu total dilution that they will have suffered. And so it's still as expensive, it's still as hard, it's just balanced a different way. How do you may, I, may I ask the audience a question? How <laughs> many of you have ever worked for some period of time for free because you were just super excited about what the company was doing? Just show of hands. Wow. Okay. I was actually paying um, startups to work with them at the beginning. But, but I, my point is just this, you mm. know, we're not a coin-operated society here. People don't work because you give them the highest paycheck. Maybe they believe in you know, the future, but you've all proven it yourself. I realize it's a little rarefied audience <laughs> to ask that question. But the reality is you can still win in this market if you have something that you're really passionate about. I think it's the harder part is finding the other people, right? It's, it's still challenging to go find those people, but I don't actually think it's about the money at all. Uh, so it, it, at least in our experience, I mean, when, when we're... Um when we're competing on a talented engineer or designer or somebody else, um, we're often competing head to head with uh, Google or Microsoft or Netflix or Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And we uh, typically win uh, and we are mm. typically not the highest bidder. Um, they, uh, and when we ask them why, because we're very curious about what works and what doesn't um, in our recruiting strategy, uh, a lot of them cite um, intangible things about you know the lifestyle benefits of being at our company and the culture and things like that that are um, that uh, you know we didn't expect to find we thought we were going to have to you know match or exceed whatever their highest offer was to get them and sometimes we say I'm sorry that's too high but there's all these other benefits and we hope you'll love to come work for us and mm. often they do mm. so I want to I want to change gears a little bit and um, Riz, Riz, talk about another thing this notion that we've accelerated the creation of new companies, does that necessarily imply an acceleration of the rate of technological change? So is, there, is this just about like a, a kind of capital flows and like sort of a, you know, a Silicon Valley sort of phenomenon? Or is there a larger, a larger uh, um, you know, larger gears at work here that actually the pace of, of change is going to accelerate because it's easier to start. So I, Daniel and I, I mean, we've been around the block here. <laughs> we could give tours around the block here. And, um, and, and he and I both remember the you know, early days of the, the confluence of sort of the Mac and PostScript and the laser writer and then PageMaker and then what happened. And you know, my argument would be over time if we look back and we say, at any time there would be these technological innovations and they would form this ecosystem that then you could have software innovations on top of it. So then there was this other, you know, then the IBM PC, and then there was the CD-ROM, and then there would be the graphical user interface, and there were, there were things, you know, and, and of course the whole time the microprocessors, network. the network, microprocessors, you know, Moore's Law and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. The thing that spins my head right now is when you go say, what is the current, in the last 24 months, what has been the foundational technology that is doing that to where we get to go shop as investors, there's like 40 of them, right? <laughs> there's, there's the screen, and there's power, and there's, and there's geo presence, and there's mo you know, mobile. And there's, I mean, you guys can, you know, we can all reel them, rattle them off, right? But the amount of technological foundation on which you can build really interesting stuff, in my, in my opinion, has gone up by like not in more than an order of magnitude. Yeah. And that's both exciting and also just really scary, yeah, right? Yeah, it's hard to keep track of it. I think Heidi's right in some respects. It's, there's also this layer, maybe to your question, Eric, of, of user-generated content. There's, you know, now that everybody's connected and it's about the content, 
as opposed to the first phase of the industry that Heidi was referring to was really everything was content less. It was about automating rational tasks, right? Moving words around and numbers and pictures and what have you and then printing them out on paper and what have you. And there were whole industries that were being dissolved and reformed into new business models. Mm -hmm. you know, and because Xerox envisioned most of it in the 70s, it just took 20 years to play out. But now, like Heidi says, every one of those things is being touched, whether it's what's going on in semiconductors, which is really fascinating, what's going on with antennas and batteries. And there's just so many different fronts, not the least of which is these new, you could call them lightweight startups in the sense right. that they happen quickly. So, so but I kind so of, can, I, can I just, right? just jump in on this really quickly? I mean, I, you know, it's a really, this whole question of, of the population of startups is a really interesting one. And I mean, if you go back, I mean, I like to sort of reframe and think about it in almost urbanism terms. You think about Jane Jacobs and sort of rethinking the nature of cities and Ed Glaser's great book, if you haven't read it, please read it, Triumph of the City, which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, one of the arguments that's implicit in Jacobs' work and explicit in Glaser's stuff is this idea that neighborhoods are sort of the atomic unit of entrepreneurship, right? That this, not just cities, but literally down at the level of neighborhoods. And why is that? Why are they the atomic unit of entrepreneurship? Why is it that entrepreneurship sort of flows out of these sorts of, you know, these neighborhoods? Well, it's not because they're lovely to look at. It's not because they have, you know, great brownstones or whatever else. It's because they're dense, right? Because they foment collisions and flux and all these things that happen when there's lots of, you know, bipedal apes wandering around and smashing yeah. into each other and <laughs> saying, you know, this would be a great idea. Did you hear what this person over there is doing? How did they make that much money? It's I'm much smarter coffee. than they are. Right, all these sorts of things <laughs> that happen whenever people start to collide in these sorts of dense neighborhoods. And so I think of startups, if you start to think of startups in those terms, right, think of them in Jane Jacobs' terms and think of them in Ed Glazer's terms as kind of urbanism idea, that the, what we're really striving for is kind of an urbanism of entrepreneurship, right? Creating more density in terms of the likelihood of more collisions between companies, not just because they get better ideas, because then they say, oh, I'd rather be over here. But if you don't have that density, you don't have those collisions, entrepreneurship doesn't work, cities don't work. It's the same notion, right? It's this sort of, if you start distilling it down, that's really what's going on. And I would add, um, We've always sort of based innovation around technology innovation. And that's what really what we used to mean. But I think that Apple has been an inspiration to show that design is actually a great vector of innovation. And today, if I look at a lot of the startups that come and visit us every day, um, design, user experience, marketing, business models are as important innovations as, you know, technological ones, depending as to what you, where you look uh, in the stack. And it's kind of interesting that when we spend an hour with an entrepreneur, we'll spend two or three minutes on the stack of technology that they use, because it's almost become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. what, what matters is user acquisition. How do you activate them? What's the customer acquisition cost? What's your LTV? And so where traditionally you wouldn't have asked those questions at the seed level, we try and understand how to map the trajectory of a company from almost inception to the sort of milestones they have to hit for a Series A, because we know that that's our job, and we need to understand what that means. Yeah, so, yeah, I, so, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I just want to add that, um, like I alluded to earlier, uh, we, there is this emphasi emphasis on design now uh, that we couldn't have before. Um, because we were too busy building software stacks and hardware to run our stuff and all of these sort of things. So the rise of cloud computing and programming frameworks and services, we have, we have lots of startups that are built on my API at SmugMug. And there, you've seen tons of them built on Twitter and Facebook and things. Mm -hmm. And many of the people working at those startups have no idea how those APIs even work because it's even been abstracted That's beyond right. that. And of course, SmugMug itself, so that all these businesses built on us, they're actually built on AWS, Amazon Web Services, because we're built on Amazon Web Services. But these other companies don't even know. So the stack continues to get deeper. Mm. But you don't have to spend nearly as much time on the nuts and bolts. And so you get to spend a lot more time on the customer experience and how the user interacts with the product and how the product looks without having to, to you know, design um, programming languages and build servers and, and all of that sort of stuff. And I'm sure. I mean, I'm an expert in web services, but I'm hearing the same thing from consumer electronics companies where they're able to work with um, Chinese uh, manufacturing facilities that can quickly retool their systems, their assembly lines to build custom products for them one off really fast. And, and I'm sure if we were to you know, pick 
just about any other industry that's seeing sort of innovation and startup growth, they can point to other technological improvements that are along those same lines that just mean that a lot of the muck has so, been taken so, away. So that, that's fascinating because it, it, it gets to something I want to talk about, which is uh, the kinds of companies we have been talking about mostly are the kinds of companies that th they're software companies or they're software-driven companies and they are relying on AWS or some other uh, you know, cloud-based services and this whole set of amazing uh, both hardware and software technologies that have been developed that Heidi was talking about. But it raises interesting questions about does that, can you apply that to you know, pharmaceuticals, to the energy industry, to, uh, to, to other parts of the economy outside of you know, the you know, 408 and 650? Like can, uh, can, can, you, can you, you know, do they, do they, does this principle scale can you can you scale this I, this way of creating businesses, you know, outside of, of of the Bay Area? Does it work in other businesses? I think, in some respects, one of the bigger trends, which is um, which is very deep and very technical and beyond my ability, other than saying this, is the big broad machine learning domain, where these big clusters of machines are doing really interesting things to analyze large amounts of data. And I do think it's going to impact all the industries that you pointed out because there's a, an opportunity to, to challenge conventional wisdom or to solve problems uh, in a very, very different way as a result of these huge machine architectures that can munge data in different ways. And it's very complicated and very hard work. And it's not as easy as just saying it's about big data. It's, it's all these various slices and uses of these machines to do interesting things for whether it's health services or new genetics or those kinds of things. So, so, so I do think there's a, there's a framework. It's a new, it's sort of like the new microprocessor is this huge cluster. Yeah. And how, you know, it was one thing to write an OS level and then, gee, a display level called PostScript or what have you or to print. It's just, it's, it's a whole other abstraction that's coming about. And there's a lot of interesting financing in the traditional sense of a venture capital as opposed to sort of the new running start startups, a lot of really deep science that's going on now in all these fields. And, and I think there, um, so, so we're, we're an early AWS uh, customer and a lot of people know it. Um, so a lot of people come out of the woodwork sort of asking me for advice on how to you know, build stuff. Um, and I'm surprised at how many of those companies are now Fortune 500 companies that are starting to, sometimes it's just the one department and sometimes it's a large organization that are starting to realize, hey, you know, we can optimize some of our processes this way. Um, and you look at some of the consumer electronics companies that go, well, this is great. I don't have to build an embedded OS anymore because Android is open source. And so that saves me a ton of time. So. You know, while I, I, I don't have a lot of experience inside of those companies, you can see it leaking out around the edges that, oh. that you know, most businesses are built one way or the other on some form of software. And the fact that the software is getting both richer and more powerful and easier to use is one way or another going to transform those businesses, whether it's visible as an outsider or not. Well, and it's, a, it's kind of, and it's sort of a wrenching transformation. I mean, I was arguing with a friend of mine yesterday that, you know, the we're talking about sort of Apple in 2011, and you know, would he, was there a better sort of a better trade in a weird way? And it turned out, you know, one of the best trades of 2011 was doing the reverse Apple trade, which was to say the Apple we were sort of <coughs> euphemistically calling the Apple Death Star trade, <laughs> was where you go long Apple and short everyone Apple's killing, and uh -huh. you know, so which was Books a Million, which was RIM, which was this endless litany of companies, and including like a, you know a Best Buy and others, you know, who's increasingly turning into like you know Amazon's show, best showroom or something, and um, yeah. so all of these all of these companies. So this transformation is coming in first through that channel, right? So the channel of actual actual creative destruction mm -hmm. it works its way in through those those markets that are most directly affected, both through products and services that can be sort of blown up by something like an Apple or an Amazon is doing. But then there's a secondary effect because you know one of the most interesting things, and you know Jeff's closer to this than I am, but is that sort of the emergence of this whole class of new sort of you know micro online retailers who are doing subscription services and discounting services and all sorts of other things where they're sort of blowing up the whole idea of what is it we sell and why do we sell it and how do we sell it and they're doing it in much leaner and much more productive ways there's a lower head count and without that's inventory, all got consequences without inventory right without inventory right i mean but that's so the transformation kind of happens in multiple ways some of which you know may seem unpleasant and others of which might seem kind of might seem wrenching but it's working its way across and it's working its way through pharma in much the same way where 
You know, there's, there's great examples of how people are just, new drugs are showing up in part because of latent facts, whether we had data about what was happening with this particular interaction in this market, and we had data about what was happening here, and the two never got pulled together. And my, as a colleague of mine at Kaufman, Sam Arbusman, it was a book coming out later this year called The Half-Life of Facts, which is, just talks to this issue about the remarkable things that are happening as sort of, you know, these, these sort of latent bits of data that we're discovering actually have to do with each other, finding each other, and transforming markets that have nothing to do with IT. And I think if, if you look at um, all the progress made in IT in terms of uh, machine learning, as Daniel said, computer vision, I mean, Google has cars that drive themselves better than each of us will do. Lower. <laughs> and if you've seen those, those um, tests of a car driving super fast around uh, a racetrack, the car drives faster than even a, um, a pilot. Why? Because it's just optimized, it's computer driven and everything. It's just unbelievable. And, you know, we sit back and say, yeah, you know, it's cool, it's Google, but it's actually freaking, you know, crazy that they actually do that. And soon, you know, we'll be able to um, text and, and email, you know, on 101 with the car just driving itself. Awesome. <laughs> but <laughs> you, you, will, you will probably not be driving at 200 miles an hour down 101. Well, you know, you don't know because once computer generated no, traffic that jams. That work on 101. You can't get yeah. on. <laughs> that's, that's an issue. But, um, but you know, computer vision, uh, machine learning, uh, you know, 3D printing is just insane. If you have seen sort of 3D printers, understanding that you can suddenly just model something and then get it after just a, a few minutes, a few hours, yeah, is is crazy. And you can do that as well with you know genes or cells and very soon i mean in 10 years so in our lifetime we'll have people actually 3d printing um you know uh, a new liver or a new esophagus sure. and then they will sort of with your cells which means that there won't be any rejection and that will just happen so like for example one of my companies dna nexus is building the um, uh, dna analysis in the cloud which is dropping the cost of a full dna sequence and analysis from forty thousand dollars to eventually ten ten dollars which means that personalized medicine will happen in our lifetime because once we've completely sequenced your genes we know what sort of interactions there might be in terms of drugs and you can get something which is completely personalized to your issues once again all this all this progress is enabled by the fact that you have infrastructure available that is the result of 10 or 20 years of you know, research and, and cloud computing and putting all those things in the cloud. So the cost actually drops to a point where we can actually use it in our everyday lives. But so infrastructure isn't evenly distributed, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the, the thing you're, you're driving at is, yes, there's, there's a whole bunch of categories where you can be lean because you have all that software stack to build on and you have all that stuff that's already been done. But that's not happening, and you know, if you if you watch the trade press and you see that there've been a number of venture firms that have gotten out of life science, right? Because they've said, hey, you know, it takes too long, and we have this government intervention, and, and it's really expensive to invent, you know, create this stuff. So we're going to get out of that space. Not everything is lean, right? Not everything sure. has infrastructure that's already there that one can build on. I think more and more of it's happening, but. I don't think it just applies everywhere. I don't. I think some things are still in some categories. If you're the entrepreneur, it's you have to raise a lot of money to get to square one because yeah, the these things are just. I mean, has it has it changed? For example, in in, in the case of of your firm, Heidi, the the things you're willing to invest in, is it has it changed the universe of things that say make sense? Um, uh, well, I, I mean, I think again, it goes back to that thing at the end. At the end of the day, is venture capitalists or not? philanthropists and they're not entrepreneurs, sorry to say. They are investing money on other people's who, behalf and they, those people expect to get multiples of it back and you're ultimately judged by cash on cash return in most places. And so if you see that you know, Joe down the street is, has been delivering outsized returns, and I would also argue that a lot of VCs look in the rearview mirror, right? So, oh, that stuff worked in the past, I'll go do that. And usually by the time you do that, you're, you know, you're also wrong. So, um, no, I, I, think that, I think that venture funds and, and a large fund like DFJ is very diverse, right? Because it's, it has the capacity to look at doing, you know, I'll call them crazy-ass deals, you know, but mm -hmm. deals like Tesla, right? right. I mean, Tesla's a kind of crazy-ass deal, right? Crazy -ass deals. So that, you, don't, you don't build a new car with $150,000 and your friends doing, you know, a lean startup over the weekend, right? You just don't. So I think some of those things, you know, it remains to be seen where, where those investments are going to pay off. I'm thankful as a, as a person who's going to benefit from some of these things that people are making these, these big bets. 
the, the vote is, I mean, in the recent environment, the liquidity that we're all salivating over has not, you know, it's primarily been these other things, not necessarily yeah. these sort of big, deep, heavy tech bets. But, but your partners, just to follow on that, Heidi, just for a second, excuse me, Don, no your partners have invested quite heavily in other, in nano and, you know. Yeah, I mean, and just green and ener yeah, energy. Yeah, but real low-level interesting science yeah. stuff as well. And I think there's a... We don't want to forget about that at the core. It doesn't play so much right. to the to the the theme of of a running start because some of these things take. It, it's a ten year running Absolutely. start to a really huge opportunity, and there's there's great investing going on there. It's mm -hmm. it's different because it's, it's new foundational capabilities as a result of nanotubes and those kinds of things. But so, com complaining right? though that it doesn't do that. I mean, it always strikes me as like that great line from uh, what is it? It's my which money pipeline movie is this? I'm going for Life of Brian. The life of Brian, well, you know, they're all in the room and they're complaining that, you know, what have the Romans ever done for us? And then, you know, it's the, aqued well, the aqueducts, the roads. The roads. So we all, start, we all start, you know, whining that there's not enough sectors of the economy being transformed by what's happening. It's like, well, screw that. I mean, the IT sector's not big enough for you. What's your problem? Yes. Um, it's a gigantic, fast-growing, widely employing, fantastic wealth-creating sector of the economy that is beginning to impinge on other sectors. And that we're not immediately transforming our ability to produce, you know, high-density batteries strikes me as... You know, right up there with saying, what have the Romans ever done for us? I mean, it's the exact same sort of instinct. I mean, I think we should give it a break. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think Tesla is an interesting example because, uh, of course, it, it's not, it wasn't a lean startup, right, in terms of it required a large amount of capital to get where they are. Um, however, you know, if you were to rewind even a few years earlier than when Tesla started, it would have cost a lot more right. than it did, right? And, and it doesn't take too many years for it to just be infinitely expensive mm -hmm. to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so Tesla, I think, happened to hit at exactly the right time with the right mix of, of uh, technologies they could build on and technologies they could invent and the right people and all kind of, you know, the mix is complex. Mm -hmm. But I think that they are, despite the large sounding number of zeros, relative to, to how difficult the, the problem they were solving was is fairly lean. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the impact that they, they will likely have yeah. with their batteries. I, I, I right. agree. So I, I want to talk to, we're going to take questions in a few minutes, but before we do that, I want to um, uh, raise another question, which is the impact on the venture business of this phenomenon of easy to, you know, make easier to get off the starting line and to be able to make progress with relatively small amounts of capital. Is this actually, is this a good thing for your business, for the venture business, Paul? I mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, it's like krill, right? I mean, I'm a whale. I like, you know, the more krill, <laughs> <laughs> the more krill, the better. And someone's out there making krill. That's got to be good for me, krill. right? So, I mean, to, to a degree, mm. I like having, you know, more, f I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's we'll that be having krill that after well, the Is that the off color? The or no? there, there's a, Ann Winblad, who's a good friend of many of ours. Um, I always had this expression, uh, she used to say, the customer bats last. And I think the interesting thing about being able to get something to minimal viabil viability as a product is you, you, you get to go out there and see what customers really think, right? It used to be that you'd have to raise money and say, well, we can't actually touch a customer for six months or 12 months yeah. or whatever, right? right? But now the expectation is that you can have customers, you know, next weekend. Now there's a little bit bad about that, right? Because there is sort of a there's a right time, there's too early and there's you know too late, and right. you got to be right on that. But I, I think that that the bias, and I'm try, I don't know yet whether there's a good bias or bad bias, is you know the the mantra of the VC today is well show me the met show me your metrics, show me your metrics, right? Show me you know if if this thing's so good and you've been on the and you've been out there for God you you've been a you've been in the app store for a week. Well, where are your metrics, <laughs> right? And so, Where's your you million know, users? Yeah, where are, you, where are your million users? Call me when you have a million users. Right? Well, when I have a million users, I don't need you. Um, right. So I think there is sort of this, there is a little bit of both a good and a bad thing about the fact that you can get out there and get going so quickly is there is this, I think, for the most part, false expectation. And there are some companies that have been tremendously successful whose metrics kind of sucked at first. Right, and then there are some other companies whose metrics were awesome at first, and then they platformed because it turned out that there were just only so many people who liked that, and then that went away. So I don't know. I think it's kind of, it's an it's an issue. Our metrics were terrible. We uh, we sold one account our first week, so we had <laughs> killed ourselves to build the product. We thought we knew what the customer wanted, 
And we shipped it and then waited around for the signups to roll in, and, and we got just one that first wow. week. Next week, we got two, Dang. and things gradually picked up, but it was slow going. The but we did, yeah. we loved that we got that one customer. We swarmed all over yeah. that one customer. So, okay, <laughs> what can we do better? You say, uh, Mom! They got, yeah. they, got <laughs> ama- they got amazing uh. service that first week. <laughs> But coming, coming back to the, uh, the question, which is, is it good or bad for venture capital? I think the, the challenge of the VC market in the Valley and to some extent uh, in other places has been that, you know, if you look back 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, when I wasn't there, um, it was just a bunch of, of small funds that had a few millions of dollars in the management that were just putting syndicates together because they couldn't get a million dollars into a company without having two or three or four of them together. And as they became successful, they sort of started to raise larger amounts of money and larger funds and the management fees started to kick in. And you know, the traditional uh, economics of a VC is that you get two, two and a half, three percent of the money on the management. And so if you have a billion dollar fund, that's actually a fuckload of money when you think about it. Um, and so, <laughs> Do you know, that. you yeah. feel good. You don't need to uh, really hustle for deals per se. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, certainly, you're like the new venture capitalist of old in many ways. The way your firm and and your peer group have come together, in the sense that you're very hands on and you do lots of work really early. And so, in some ways, things are there's a new normal of of because of that funding gap, which exactly. which started right. to happen in 2005, right. and you know. To be candid, VCs should have reacted much faster, saying this is the new opportunity, which right. was just realign ourselves to making money in that spe- specific world where, you know, yes, a company might only exit for 50 million, but if you got in at, you know, two and a half posts, you will still make quite a bit of cash on cash return, not a lot of money per se. Mm-hmm. And so it was just too late for them to, um, to do that. And that's why we just rushed into it and became the, the new normal for, uh, sort of lean startup financing. Well, and so you just had too much money to do that model, right? You couldn't, if you, had, if you were managing half a billion dollars or a billion dollars, you, can't, you couldn't do it a million dollars at a time. Well, it's not unlike what yeah, happened in the general tech industry is the, the early stage, you know, Microsoft was a startup, Intuit was a startup. I mean, these companies got big and then there's a gap and then people swarm in and do other things in and around them. And the same thing happened in the venture business. So. Uh, but but to your point about the amount of money that's still in the system, it's mm. it's quite quite significant. So no, oh, it's I mean it's still we you know it's the old line of takes ten years to kill a venture fund whether it succeeds or fails, right? I mean, mm-hmm. and that's the trouble, right? Is so you're sort of the the, the 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 big slug of capital is working it through the Python and is only finally coming out the other end right now in two thousand or in what year is this? Twenty twelve. In twenty twelve. Yeah, the ninety nine the, funds. The, are... the funds that were like the two thousand funds and then the two thousand and one, two thousand and two oops funds where somebody said, Oh crap, I committed to this. And so, you know, and now it's sort of it's working its way out the other side. And now suddenly you're seeing this contraction that's been overdue for a decade. It's been right. obvious to all of us that it had to happen, but the reason why was that it's not a liquid market where you can just say, well, screw it, I'm going to sell my stock in those guys. Well, you don't get to do that unless you want to do it on the secondary market and take a 60% haircut, and so people hang on, and the fund has an existence much longer than makes economic sense, and so now we're sitting at the other end of that 10-year cycle, and it's finally possible to contract the industry back, you know, bring it back to health. My concern with respect to the micro VC funds is that there's that, you know, as most sort of venture guys will say, is that nobody raises a second seed fund, right? Either they fail, in which case they don't get to raise a second one, or they succeed, in which this case they say, screw this, this is way too much work, I'm going to get $150 million and make some real money at this stuff. And so the <laughs> risk is, is that the micro VCs like Jeff and others are so successful that despite having done a great job of servicing this hole in the market, is they make the economically rational calculation of saying, you know what, I don't want to run $30 million and work my ass off chasing all these companies all over the place for you know $250,000 investments. And quite legit Legitimately, they go up market and raise 120 million, and we're right back where we were before. And I think that's one of the unsort of spoken risks. And you, your your current fund size, how big, Jeff? So it's 55. And how big was your last fund? 15. Uh, but <laughs> and how big is your next fund? Uh, same, you know, we, we don't, <laughs> my, my guess is more or less same size. And so, and the reason why we did, you know, 15 to 55, which yes, it's 3x, a bit more. How much um, more? is not because we wanted to make money on management fees, it's because <coughs> when, when, because <laughs> we still don't make money on management fees. Although that's nice. Um, <laughs> well, I do the math, right? And you have a structure, uh, anyway. Um, the point is, when, when I, I raised SoftTech 2, which was a $15 million fund, I actually didn't want or wasn't planning to raise a fund per se, 
because we're back 2007. 2007 is when you know the VC start waking up to um, this seed opportunity and go, what the hell have we done to ourselves? We're no longer the go-to guys for the entrepreneurs. They are. And so they sort of try and figure out how to build their own seed programs and so on and so forth. And you know, people sort of come to a few of us and say, hey, how about we give you money and we, you become your, our feeder. So you show us everything. And mm. if we like a deal, we do it. If we don't like it, you show it to the others. And some have <laughs> said yes, and some mm. others have said, screw you. Um, and <laughs> you know, it still gave me the opportunity to That's raise great. a fund. And it wasn't sort of that I wanted to raise a fund. I raised the fund because I could. And I invested you know, in 65 companies, refining what that micro strategy really meant. And fund three to me is the optimal, from my vantage point, the optimal implementation of micro VC strategy, which is you invest in about 60 companies over three years. You invest an average of 400K per company. You take five to 10% ownership, and then you have a lot of cash to actually pile in to um, invest the in your winners, which by the way is exactly what VCs do. We just do it at a scale that really bodes well for the seed opportunity. And so unless we, we someone can demonstrate to me, including myself, that um, <laughs> the next fund should actually be much bigger because it makes sense, we won't, we won't do that. It's really about doing a well sites fund every three years. Okay. Let's, um, so it was a long explanation. Let's take a couple of questions. Do we, uh, we have a couple of mics There's floating no around the room. <laughs> And I was told, let the people with the mics pick the question. So um, let's take the first one. Go ahead. So I'm not sure if the Jobs Act got passed, but oh, how's that going to affect? Oh, uh, anticipate my next question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your Job industry. So, I, so we, we actually were very supportive of the Jobs Act. And we, uh, we wrote an op-ed, uh, four of us, uh, True Ventures, um, SoftTech, First Round, and Foundry wrote an op-ed to uh, really sort of push this one. Um, the Jobs Act is two things. One is is let go of us and let us build companies without the 500 shareholder sort of rule and limitations and everything. That's one thing, and and sort of uh, trying to push for small IPOs so we can actually get companies faster on the market on the, the public market. That's one thing. And then the second is enable crowdfunding. And crowdfunding, to be really candid, is I don't think that crowdfunding is going to change anything to what we do because the kinds of entrepreneurs who want to try and raise you know, the, the capital from people like us because of the support and experience that they get will still do that. However, it will give the opportunity to people you know, building a restaurant or opening a restaurant or doing all the types of companies that are not venture scale. That's what ID was talking about at the beginning. Not being not venture scale, we'll, you will hear as an entrepreneur, hey, we don't think it's large enough or big enough. Then crowdfunding could actually be that initial funding option that will get you off the ground. So I think it's actually awesome. Uh, so any, any dissenters? Anybody think it's a bad thing? Oh, uh, I, I don't think it's a bad uh, thing, um, but I think I disagree slightly in that I think it, I think it has the, I, I think some founders will uh, of you know, high tech startups may choose that route. Um, rather than going even to micro, wh whatever the term is uh, for, for the super angels or micro VC or whatever, um, uh, because we're seeing, we're essentially seeing some of that already on Kickstarter, um, and and so you know if I were able, if I thought I had a great idea and I knew I needed some capital to do it, um, and there was a Kickstarter-like approach to sort of getting my idea out and finding out if other people agreed and, oh, if they agree, they could be investors. Man, I, I would consider that route. That seems like a very appealing route. So I, I generally think it's a good thing, but I have two fairly massive concerns. I mean, one is that, and it has to do with the nature of the investing marketplace, and uh, is that there's only really one country in the world that sort of fully democratized seed stage financing over the last 25, 30 years. Anyone? Take a shot at it. Who did that? It's the Great White North. The Great White North. Those kids up in Canada. Canadians, yeah. So the Canadians did. Circa 1984-85, they introduced this idea of labor-sponsored venture capital funds, which were a, a, a direct tax-advantaged, democratized seed financing of early-stage companies. You could literally take a chunk of your paycheck and have it flow directly into these seed financing entities that, in turn, in theory, 
uh, funded the marketplace. So what happened in Canada? Uh, so you know, as, as an LP friend of mine likes to say, I haven't looked since Nortel and Rim. What have I missed? And the answer is nothing. Right? <laughs> so, and so in terms of ma big major successes, and that's a real problem. And it's a problem in particular because what happened in the marketplace was is this incredible explosion in early stage capital. Who did it really crush out of the marketplace? It completely mispriced early stage risk. So institutional venture money abandoned the marketplace. They all exited. They said, you know, there's no reason for me to have an allocation to Canadian venture. And so US LPs left, Canadian LPs sort of reluctantly hung around, badgered by politicians. And so they stayed in for a while. But the reality was the returns were no longer competitive on the market, in large part because of this massive flood of money in through this channel of retail investors who said, you know, wouldn't this be cool to fund the next Microsoft? And so they, all the money came flowing in. So the risk in this model is it really depends on what the SEC decides with respect, because we're still, you know, in the early stages of fleshing it out, mm -hmm. of what kind of vehicles get created oh, wow. to sort of institutionalize yeah, I, the flow I, of money. I, I is it say, ETFs to say, or is it Kickstarter? As, what is it? As, what does it look as, like? As someone who like lived through, you know, wrote about like the you know, the ugliest of the penny stock sort of scandal days, which mm. coincided with some of what was going on in Canada, by the way. There was a lot of, oh, there was a lot of cross-border transactions going House on. Street, and that, <laughs> yeah, House Street, baby. House Street, exactly. <laughs> and uh, some of it ended up in, you know, in Salt Lake City and Denver right. and Palm Beach. So, right. um, you know, is, is the, to me it feels a little bit like the Scam Artist Support Act of like 2012. Like it, it feels like a little <laughs> bit like you're, you're creating opportunity here for being able to take huge advantage and that if, if the SEC is not careful about how you construct a set of rules that say we're going to lower the bar on, on disclosure and you know, your ability to you know, get regular folk uh, invested in you know, uh, kind of various kinds of very early stage companies, Ooh, it just gives me the willies a little bit about that. So that I, I think there are the two situation. interesting things here um, that are so. I mean, we've been talking about it now for an hour or something. There's there's a very different sort of capital barrier to entry than there was in the mid '90s, in you know, w with the Canada thing. So, um, uh, I think that's one important change with with trying it here in the U.S. And I think the other important thing is services like Kickstarter, right? So this. This has, I, I'm positive some scam artists are gonna get away with millions and it's no. gonna happen. But I'm, 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 pretty, I'm pretty sure there's gonna be some big success yeah. stories too and they're gonna be enabled by Kickstarter-like products for finding and collecting the investors and it's gonna be sort of a, a vetted sort of a thing using social media and things to make sure that it's not a scam artist asking for the money and, and that you get a little bit of cachet or reward or something for being an investor. You get to put the badge on your Facebook right. stream or you, whatever. I think, there's, I think there's sort of going to be a power around um, the open sort of social networking um, ability to leverage um, average people investing that there, we haven't had before right. in history. And, Coupled with this much lower barrier to for certain types of companies um, uh, for capital, I think that could be a, a very powerful co cocktail. I, I hope you're right. I, I do. I do. I'll say one last thing, and we'll take another question. Uh, I'll get. I get the last word because I'm not. Um, the, 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 uh, there was there was a point some years ago. Uh, I'm really dating myself here. Where the American Stock Exchange, when there was one, um, created this thing called the uh, the Emerging Company Marketplace, which oh, the yeah. ECM. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. And the the idea of the, of this was that we're going to lower our listing standards so <laughs> low that like almost anything could list on a public uh, U.S. stock exchange, and you kind of got predictable results. Um, there were not a lot of quality companies trading on on that thing, and it went away. So there's some risk. Speed I, speed? I understand that disclosure is different. There's a lot of but things. It's like the, but it's the Michael Kinsley argument, right? That if you're not wasting if you're not wasting some money, you're not spending enough. Right. And I think we've seen that in the U.S. stock market post Sarbanes Oxley. That arguably the pendulum went so far in the other direction that quality companies couldn't go public. And it was becoming, in many ways, too restrictive at a whole bunch of points in the early stage funding continuum. So I wholeheartedly endorse the idea of, of more wastage at the margin. But to say, <laughs> suggest that that means that the whole market then becomes like a, this becomes like a, the Jobs Act is really a, you know, an API for Boulder Rooms, I think is too far, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take another question. Yeah. Um, about uh, two years ago, I heard a venture capitalist speak, and he was describing the trajectory of profits in the venture capital industry. He pointed out that in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the VC community in Silicon Valley as a whole was profitable. But since about 2000, 
uh, up to about two years ago at least, it had lost money. <laughs> Has that turned around in the last two years, or is the VC community still overall lose? It's my hands rustling moment again. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's still losing. So uh, it's the the five year and ten year numbers went negative about 2007 and have more or less stayed since. I mean, there's a, there's obviously a, a resurgence to some degree. You know, and, and Facebook has the potential to transform a whole bunch of funds' fortune. But as an asset class, yeah. vent, venture writ large, and hanging its hat on you know five and ten year numbers, the five and ten year numbers are still. Uh, are turned negative and have stayed negative for the industry. I mean, I had someone recently suggest to me that the problem with, the, with investors in venture is that you shouldn't be investing in venture with a five-year or 10-year horizon. You should be thinking 20, 25 years. And I said, screw that. You should take it right out to 100 and get plausible deniability. The answer is it's still bad. So. But, but to Paul's <laughs> point, if you go back, probably what you heard someone speaking about was that if, if you looked sort of from the beginning more or less, let's just say the 70s, early 70s with venture, till the mid 90s. When the cash, when the capital exploded. Before that, there was, there was a very straight line of more capital going in and a growing set of industries mm -hmm. around semiconductors and software and what have you. And the total number of firms that were actively investing and raising capital was about 300, 350. I could be off by a few, but it's not much. And then between 95 and 2000, the number of firms went well beyond a thousand. Eighteen hundred. How many? Eighteen hundred. Yeah. And <laughs> now, in terms of firms actively investing more than like two or three deals a year, which means they have new money to do something, we're back into the 400, 450 range. Mm -hmm. So what Paul pointed out is very, very true. There's this huge amount of money that came in in a three to five year period that is taking 12, 15 years to go away. And then meanwhile, the cornerstone of the venture industry, the the top firms, if you will, they're making money or as a result of Facebook and other things, they will make money on the horizon that a venture firm needs to make money, which is every 10 to 15 years. So it is getting back to a newer set of norms that just was this wacky anomaly <laughs> around Y2K selling and this, this typical belief uh, which occurs every 50 years and in every key cycle around things that just explode and become a bubble. And, and, then, and then there's a, there's a rationalization and then a build out that's very real, which is what's going on now. And that, that, that is a fundamental set of shifts that, that I think are very true. And you could probably cor correct me with the absolute stats, but that's roughly it. Yeah, yeah. that's roughly it. Yeah. Next question. Yeah, you know, there have been a couple, you know, over time there have been interesting technologies or capabilities that have given startups a big boost. AWS was one, open source was another. There have been other things, you know, like Mechanical Turk, which open up interesting possibilities. What are the things that people in a room should be thinking about that aren't widely known yet that would give startups Ooh. a running start? Hmm. If we knew that. Would you invest in this? <laughs> you should be presiding some, right? Your little startup <laughs> program, BizSpark, right? Sure. I was giving you a platform there, Daniel, but that's more. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you should do with BeastBark, it's an awesome program. Um, no, it's for real. Um, I think the, um, it's really understanding the stack really, really well. And yes, AWS and EC2 are here, but you have a bunch of other layers of technology which have been built on top, which you need to know so that you, you never reinvent the wheel. And if ever you have to reinvent a part of the wheel, you contribute that part back to the open source community so that everyone can leverage it and you no longer have to build infrastructure unless it's really your business. And so it's really have technologies who are really strong at architecting and really leverage at the maximum everything which is out there. And so people are really sort of building those, those patchworks of technology which 10, 15 years ago would have been absolutely frightening in terms of dependencies and everything. But today, somehow, this is actually the way to build a startup. I think there's a layering process that sort of alluded to it earlier um, in various ways. And you could think about it relative to the, the first sort of disruption that occurred with the microprocessor and general purpose operating systems. And um, I, I say this often, so some of you may have heard it. Uh, it there was a thing called the word processor that roamed the earth a long time ago. <laughs> and like dinosaurs, they cost $40,000 and a company called Wang built them and people pay you know, money and there were typing pools and all that. And then there was this floppy disk that came along that had a word processor on it. And gee, then there was a market for spell checkers and people used to buy spell checkers. And, it, 
eventually there's this layering process. So I do think in these new architectures, the web services and what Amazon is sort of certainly the front runner on that and Microsoft, we're doing a lot in that area as well. These, these big distributed machine architectures are being built. There will be some fascinating new layers that emerge and there are some really smart people attacking those layers and, and they'll, some of them will stand alone and be an interesting thing and some of them will just get consolidated into the stack like they, they typically do and the stack will be you know, a, a layer of capability that will be broadly used horizontally in the enterprise for Salesforce automation at the point of sale that amortizes all the back end you know, ERP and, 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 and customer record systems that the multinationals have and you know, what, what deal are you able to produce in the moment because you're physically in a location that the system knows is okay you know, for, at a moment in time during the quarter and you've got a policy set. So there's all these things that are going to happen, but it's policy and new layers of system architecture that I think really deep enterprise capable entrepreneurs are going to go build. I think there's a whole layer of stuff that's going to come back there and then there's a lot of the social stuff that's just is what we all see right now. But I think we're going to go right back into the core of really deep science and interesting enterprise stuff because there's way too much money in that system that's not being efficiently deployed with the way the systems are crafted today. I want to just answer to your question with, with another question though for you all to think of. I don't know the answer, but I'll tell you something I think you should all be looking at and, and I know it's something that we look at and our entrepreneurs look at is Entrepreneurs, especially in Silicon Valley, think that all the innovation happens in technology and forget about everything else. And some of the most in interesting innovation that happens not here is around channel marketing, Salesforce, business model, other stuff. And I think that we have been, we've had some really innovative business model revolutions here, but when I get excited, and, and you know, again, I won't, I'm not going to say it because you know, I just met with an entrepreneur yesterday who had a really different business model, right? There was nothing innovation, innovative about the technology, but the business model was really amazing. I don't know if it's going to be successful or not, but I thought, wow, that's really interesting where all the innovation is happening, not on the product itself. And I would just encourage everyone that I, I think, a lot, you know, again, there's a lot of successes out there. The, you know, you, we had um, um, Adam Lowry who founded Method Soap, right, who spoke at our class, right? And they're, you know, they're over 100 million in revenue and they make soap, right? It's not new. Um, but it was everything else they did around how they did that, right? And, and I think it's always astounding to my students that you could like build a $100 million business, oh, by the way, in the last, you know, 10 years or so, making like soap. And I have friends who have innovated in popcorn and, you know, other things, right? Where you're like, you got to be kidding me. And, and they build these, you know, hundreds of millions in revenue companies because they thought differently about customer and customer acquisition and business model. And I would just encourage, I, I think that that's what I'm looking forward to is like five years from now I'm going to go, God, why didn't I think of that? Like, because that was, you know, I'm an English major. I could have thought of that. Mm -hmm. I can't code, but I should have thought of that. So I think there's a lot going on in that space. Yeah, I, I, just to add to what everybody has said, I think, I think one of the things uh, we've over time gotten good at asking ourselves is uh, when we have we come across some new thing that our business has to do um, is I wonder if we really need to build or buy that or if somebody's already done it uh, and so you know AWS and cloud computing gets all the headlines um, but there are thousands of other services that are very vertical and solve tons and tons of things that especially a startup needs but even fairly large businesses so we you know, we uh, sell prints and gifts in lots of places all over the world and all over the U.S., and it turns out that every state and even some counties have wildly different sales tax laws, and so it's a real headache to figure all this stuff out, right, especially if you're two guys in a dorm. It turns out there's a web service for that that will just, like, you just tell them the zip code and of where the purchasee and the purchaser are, and they just give you the tax rate back, and you can like do that. And same thing for HR services and customer relationship and all these things that aren't considered high tech, but they're necess they're a necessity for building a business. If you can, if you think you need it, somebody is probably willing to sell it and host it and provide it for you, and they likely integrate with all the other services that need to to do all that uh, and you, so you don't you don't have to go buy some expensive system and maybe even staff up to handle that system 
you can just find a service to do it for you. Sure. That's why defining as, as a startup entrepreneur, you really define what is your core expertise and the core value you're going to build and focus on that. And that's your unique piece of the equation. Anything else below, above, whatever, find the API to actually make it happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as Don said, it's highly likely that there is a startup that has built that thin layer of the stack that is actually so important. An example is, most startups these days rely on email for activation or retention. And it turns out that sending emails by the ten of thousands or hundreds or millions is really, really hard. And if you try and do it yourself, you're going to have a team of 10 or 20 people actually dealing with the IP addresses and the rotation and the uh, delivery and so on and so forth. So find a company, actually, it's SendGrade, but anyway, it's fine, <laughs> um, which actually takes care of that because it's what they do. And they have 13 or 14,000 you know, startups sort of using them and companies just because they're excellent at that. My, uh my sort of mag my favorite example, sort of the magic technology that not enough people focus on, is this one. I don't know, maybe you've heard of it. It's called Float, and uh, it's this idea of you know I collect early and I pay late, <laughs> and I. <laughs> it's That's just the beginning. Uh, Make it yeah. capital. I mean, you know, awesome. maybe Don knows this better than I do, but I mean, there's a great paper out a couple of years ago from a bunch of Belgian researchers looking at bootstrapping, and they were looking at all these crazy things that bootstrap companies do and trying to find out, you know, where's the leverage in the system? Who carries what's the, the flow? You know, what's the best way to sort of dictate whether or not a company really has an inflection point in their business? And the number one thing that came out of it in bootstrap companies in terms was in technology, was it this, was it that? They all had one thing in common. They collected aggressively and early, and they paid light. Right. It was the magic technology. Right. Didn't matter what sector they were in, didn't matter what they were doing, well, they Dell. all did that. Dell was yeah. the classic. Right, well, Dell's the, the classic beginning. example. It's beautiful. Then the customer financing is a wonderful thing, you know. So let's take another question. Cool. Um, uh, Paul, could you add some color for your hands, uh, Rosling moment, in terms of those uh, startup companies per capita? Uh -huh. Does that include lifestyle businesses and across all sectors, or is that? Uh, yeah, that's across the so that's across the board. That's from the the Bureau of Economic Analysis data crossed with um, a couple of the database, the business Hoover's database business uh, listings as well. So it's a it's a comprehensive list across all sectors. So it's how, it's how do you account for that in the face of the low cost of startup today? Well, it's and it's because we're seeing things through the lens of what we see here in the Bay Area, right? I mean, the preponderance of companies created in the United States have absolutely nothing to do with what happens in the Bay Area, right? It's dry cleaners, it's flo it's florists, it's all it's these other six or seven hundred thousand a year it's, in any given year, right? It's service businesses, right? And you know, even among the fastest growing companies in the United States, say you look, take the Inc. 500 list as an example, only about fourteen percent of those companies take any kind of institutional money from anybody. So even among the fastest growing companies they're not disproportionately represented by companies that take external capital. So when you start going down and funneling your way down, what you realize fairly quickly is that in some sense it should be t utterly unsurprising that the preponderance of companies are doing things that for the most part aren't very related to what happens in the sorts of things that we talk about and as a result are only slowly being affected. But having said that, they are now being affected. I mean, you look at the retail industry is a great example. You know, it's incredibly productive, but hasn't added square, f in terms of the, the, the total sort of dollars per square foot in the United States in commercial real estate, we haven't added square feet in 12 years. And it's not just because of the real estate crash. It's because so much of it has moved online and so, is increasingly so, doing that. So, so anyways, one, one thing about that, Paul, is that, the, um, that data about uh, the reduction in like, new company creation yeah. uh, was, was thrown around a lot by, like, uh, by Steve Case and other people who are big supporters of the Jobs Act. Yeah. And, I, I wonder if there's if if one is actually going to impact the other. So, like, aside from the the particular merits of uh, you know the Jobs Act or Scam Creation Act, whatever, um, it, I, I wonder if that actually is really getting to that problem. Like, whether that some of the the aspects of that law will in fact lead to more company creation. But that's back to what have the Romans ever done for us again? I mean, so <laughs> it's this thing that yeah, I guess so. Well, I mean, I mean, it's just that that's that's. It's supposed to be one of the... No, no, it is, but my point is, is that you have to start somewhere, and when you create these kind of absolutist goals where you say, unless we can truly move the needle this much, I don't want to move it this much. And so, you know, there's this incredible thing about, you know, we humans is we're wildly envious and we see some, you know, idiot down the hallway make a bunch of money doing something. Our first reaction is, you know, I'm, I'm at least as good or as smart as they are. Mm -hmm. This could have been me. And so we go out and we do things we imitate and we mimic. And so seeing examples around us of people be successful, even on a small scale, can move the needle in a huge way, even if not directly through those programs. Next question. Hi. Um, very quick question about um, how you think about uh, overseas markets. Do we even think of markets as being overseas now, uh, given that you know technologies are so widely distributed and social and mobile is driving so much of uh, customer acquisition? Can we certainly? 
I mean, we see things <laughs> everywhere because of the scale of our, our business. And so there is an immense amount of activity everywhere locally. And um, I would say it's, you know, whether it's your favorite Friedman thing about the world being flat or just the rise of others, it's, but there are smart people everywhere in virtually every country in the world. There is a top of the pyramid, there's money. Uh, and they all want to create jobs, and there are in many parts of the world, you know, this this huge uh, percentage of the population under the age of 30, which means they're hungry and they're going to have kids, uh, and 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 so there's a huge uh, shift um, in in sort of this indigenous innovation, if you will, taking to the extreme. If you think about China as a unique market and a special case, there is a lot of internal entrepreneurism and innovation going on in every country in the world and so, uh, we see it across the board and we're in, invested in it in terms of coalescing the communities and teaching best practices as best we can where we have permission to add value which is typically with software platforms and tools and training and things like that and then the others around the table are trying to recreate this unique phenomenon but the key point is no one will be like Silicon Valley. They need to be like themselves and capitalize on their own strengths. And so we spend a lot of time on those issues, again, everywhere locally. So I'm curious from Jeff's point of view and then and from Heidi's about whether are they looking outside the valley? Well, DFJ is a special case in terms of venture firms, yeah, I would DFJ say. DFJ has had an amazing track record of, you know, Estonia and China and you know some of their biggest Brazil deals are and Skype and Baidu and right. so ab absolutely and they've built you know I think Tim Draper was was very foresightful in, yeah. in building the DFJ affiliate funds to, to mm -hmm. be able to surface deals from all over the place. That said, it's really hard to do an early stage deal really far away. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I think that the, the challenge for us is really, I mean, we invest roughly 80% of what we do in the Valley, 10% in New York, and for us New York is now sort of a suburb of the Valley. <laughs> sort of. um, we do quite a bit of um, SoCal, we do Boulder, and we've started to um, look at some uh, genuinely interesting uh, European opportunities that have a, a pan-European uh, sort of ambition. So a lot of European entrepreneurs will start with their countries and then potentially go to the next one and so on and so forth. So they rarely sort of have this, this notion of I'm going to own Europe, which is a pretty freaking big market if you succeed. And, you know, things that we think have the potential to scale. But it's impossible for us to, you know, lead around or participate to the day-to-day -day operations of the company. So what we do is we play the U.S. cousin sort of size of, side of the syndicate where we help build a very strong local syndicate uh, in their country, often involving you know, some of the funds in Europe, uh, sorry, in, in London, because this is where you have sort of the, the real um, cachet and exp expertise um, in, uh, in European venture capital. And then our um, anticipation is that they will be able to raise uh, money here and this is where we'll help and recently one of our companies Songkick uh, after uh, raising seed money from uh, from us and a few friends in uh, in London raised their series A from index and raised the series B from Sequoia and that was sort of a 10 million dollar round uh, that Sequoia was very excited about um, putting together which is pretty rare and so those are models that will will be open to look into but you know, if you look at 60-ish companies in, uh, in every fund, we'll do three, potentially. But I, I want to throw something else out here because I think this is important for all of us who are homeowners in Silicon Valley and we think about things like, you know, are, are we like toast in the future because it's all global and all these great entrepreneurs. Um, first of all, the, the percentage of venture capital, at least as part of percentage of the U.S., and I believe it's percentage of the world, right, into Silicon Valley has actually gone up as a percentage, right? More venture as a percent of the total venture invested is coming here. Second thing is, I'll tell you, because I see them all the time, right? I teach at Stanford in the engineering department. It's like the UN in there, right? And you know where those students want to go when they graduate? Here. They want, they're here for a reason. They come here for a reason. The, the, a number of companies, I have I, little companies find me all the time. This company I'm working with right now, the founders started a successful company in Europe they are in their 20s and they came here because they said we want to do something even bigger and they are all you know trying to get you know get visas so they can be here and not only did they come but they brought three million dollars of their own money to invest in our economy hiring people to be here so I think there is still this yeah. incredible thing and I think 
all of us, as I, I think people who are invested at least in some point in the success of Silicon Valley, we have this really incredible machine that we've built here. And you know, it, it, as somebody said to me once, you know, the, the, the thing that the US is the most innovative about is um, immigration, right? <laughs> That's what we've been in the past. That's what this country is built on. I know I'm the first US born citizen in my family. So we should be really careful about that. And I, and I know, you know, I mean, I mean everybody absolutely. here has worked on policy to make right. sure that we keep those best and brightest and we attract them here and we open them with welcome arms. And that's been a super problem here. And I can tell you, these are the people I'm dealing with, some of these people you would, you would love to work with these people. And they are literally being turned back, right, mm -hmm. at the airport and sent home. And, and Jobs Act has, has gone through, great, but the next one we need to get through is Startup Visa, Startup which Visa, is yeah. an yep. initiative we've worked that for you know, three years. No brainer, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Which is basically saying any entrepreneur, you know, any, any country, um, sort of religion, whatever, it doesn't matter, if they get uh, startup financing from a set of accredited investors, uh, typically people like, people like us, then they will get you know, uh, visas and green cards that allows them to stay in the US and create jobs in the US. And unfortunately, whilst everyone agrees uh, in the house, everywhere, that this is good, we, we sort of stuck with a comprehensive reform of the immigration policy, <laughs> which means, you know, forget it for 10 years. Because right. they, they take those 50 to 100,000 visas for entrepreneurs and they stuck them with the 10 million you know, people who don't have papers and they say, well, we have to deal with this and that at the same time, which doesn't make any sense. I like the concept sure. of like let a thousand flowers bloom as long as the flowers are near an exit of 101. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's say we've got time for like one more question. Let's go in the back. Uh, so Heidi, you mentioned about like 40 fundamentals that have come up and uh, now you have more fundamentals that you can grow your market in. But uh, do you think are they all uh, solid in their uh, backings or do they all come down to too big too big maybe social and mobile as the big uh, fundamentals and everything else is just a uh, breakdown of those uh, two major ones well i don't you know i don't know because my view of the entire world of technology is you know this big right it's the things that i focus on and because i focus on things that are consumer facing i tend to see those things that are consumer facing but I, you know, for example, I'm on the board of a company called Prism. They're using lasers to excite phosphor to make a new kind of television that, you know, operates on 20% of the power of regular TV and emits no heat. So it has this amazing advantage. You know, that's a, that's a big science project. That costs a lot of money, and that's really breakthrough patented technology. I don't know. Where's that going to end up? How's that going to work? That's not social. It's not mobile. It's not built. They had to go deep science for a long time and spend a lot of money to create that. And I'm sure I'm just one example with one company. I think there's a lot of that going on. I just think that it's not as accessible. You know, and I think this is a little bit the challenge is that we're all consumers of this kind of technology. So the things we tend to think about and see are the things we're using or maybe our kids are using or you know, whatever. But there's a lot of other stuff going on that's being enabled by some of the same basic R&D and basic te technology breakthroughs that we're just not exposed to yet. So I do believe there's a lot more out there. I just don't think it's as exposed as, it's you know, social not, mobile We should stuff. ask Eric a question. It's just certainly generally not covered in the, in, the, in the current popular press. There's just a huge amount of interesting stuff going on, though, to Heidi's point. I think much more so than there ever has been. There's still, again, you picked a number, there's 40 fronts, there's all these different areas. It's, it's very probably, different. Probably bigger than 40. It's Pick just, a number. Yeah. It's well, just, well, it's just well, a lot of it just isn't right? immediately tangible, right? right. So right. you can't like, you know, read an article or see a news report or something about it and go and play with it like mm. you can about something that's on Best Buy or in the App Store or at a URL. Right. Well, and I think what tends to happen a little bit is when you, you, you slap a big label on something that says social, mobile, local, you know, right. big yeah. data, cloud, right? Um, <laughs> that's, that's everything there is, right? So, right. but like underneath that, there's like a zillion individual, right. um, you know, wh where did those come from? Well, they're built on a set of technologies, whether it's, you know, uh, wireless, Connectivity in this whole area of you know telecommunications infrastructure or uh, particular kinds of you know even things like you know GPS technology and doing uh, you know a, a presence and all those kinds of things. There's like a there's a zillion. I don't know what the right number is. There's, there's no way, there is no right number. A zillion. But that there's a good. zillion. Yeah, maybe two zillion. I'm not sure. Maybe it's a gazillion. Um, 
but there's a lot of those things, and um, it gets a little glossed over sometimes with the desire to put a big label on everything. Yeah. But Jeff, you wanted to. Yeah, I think there lies sort of the challenge for entrepreneurs is that it's so easy to start something that sometimes they, it's it's easy to forget the concept of significance and and whether you know you really try and make the world a better place or change the world or have this really real disruption that you work on. And sometimes we see awesome teams building you know fantastic things in the photo sharing space and it's like oh you you got to be fucking kidding me just apply your smarts <laughs> to something that actually matters because at the end of the hey. day <laughs> no seriously it's like you you see people on, and, <laughs> and i'm not you know <laughs> taking revenge on, on because he's done it he's proven it go do something else right that sounds and like great advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave those guys alone. But, uh, <laughs> but, but seriously, um, there, are, there are a ton of, of things to be invented. So when you think about, you know, is what I'm building sort of really significant, significantly different, it's not about being 10%, 20% better. It's a 1,000% better or completely disruptive to a market economy that creates eventually new, new wealth or uh, a new set of economics. So to us, it's really a question of, well, is this thing going to move the needle or not? And it's not talking about us, but is it important? Is it fundamentally something that we, we would appreciate to try and, and fund, even if it's very really risky because it can make a difference? And we try and really sort of have a portion of the portfolio be um, sort of a few crazy investments that will most likely fail. But if they don't, like, you know, we're showing um, um, uh, Eric or the, the Fitbit, which is this. Uh, so the next generation photometer, which I funded back in 2008, but it was my first attempt at capital efficient hardware. And, you know, I have one on. awesome. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> and the thing is, if you have the Fitbit, you will actually be compelled to actually do more exercise and, and, you know, all your sort of personal metrics will improve. But anyway, the point is, it was a crazy investment, which has handsomely paid out to date. And that's the one sort of things that I, I think people sort of should try and do more of than trying to do, um, you know, the next photo sharing startups. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, Amen. It, 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 no, go ahead. Go ahead, no. go ahead, Don. No, I mean, I, I, I think I, I completely agree, especially about the don't do a photo sharing startup. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as somebody once said, you know, here's to the crazy ones. Right? There you go. Um, and I think we're about out of time. Okay. Right. Right. Appreciate that very much. I want to thank our speakers for spending your evening with us and for sharing your perspectives and insights so freely. As a token of our thanks, we have for you the much coveted Churchill Club t-shirt. We hope you will wear it with great pride. Come back and get another one soon. And you have been a great audience. Thank you so much for coming. Have a wonderful evening.